So yes, we are in part two of our series through Colossians. So last week we read the whole letter. And so uh, hopefully you brought it back this week. If you did not, some of the ushers back there, if you would come forward with a couple of these, if you just put your hand up, you can get a copy of the letter. Um, and that would be great. Um, so yeah, we went through the whole letter last week, tried to read it. We, we printed it in a kind of a handwritten font so that it would just, um, be able to convey a little bit of that authenticity. We can't get back to the full authenticity, but a little bit of it and uh, took out the verses and the chapter numbers and all that stuff. So it was one full complete letter so that we could see the forest instead of just the trees. So we could see the big picture and not just the little individual specific pictures. And so we talked about some of the big themes that are in here, this theme of this mystery being revealed in Christ and that that mystery then resides in us, Christ hidden in us. Um, we talked about Christ's supremacy. And so I encourage people to uh, take a good hard look at that, those verses that Steve just read in the midst of that last worship song and I encourage people to memorize those. So let me know how that goes. I would love to hear from you. Um, and then we also talked about one of the other big themes in here, the theme of this transition from this earthly way of life, a way that's distorted because of what's happened through humanity, a way back toward God's intentions and those things sort of coming forward from these heavenly places, this divine thing that's happening in Christ. So away from this earthly fleshly into this divine in Christ. So those are some of the big themes. So that's a little bit of an orientation for you. I want to give you a little bit more of an orientation as we head into this part of it, just so you know what's happening here, that Paul is most likely in prison. And so this is this is uh, kind of this antiquated looking font on this, but I think this is one of the clearest images I could find of what's happening here. So this is the ancient Middle East. And what you've got here, of course, is modern day Italy and Greece. And then this is modern day Turkey. And you can see, hey, there's a letter to the Philippians, a letter to the Thessalonians, a letter to the Corinthians, a letter to the Romans. And then of course, there's a letter to the Ephesians. This one, he's in Ephesus in prison on the coast there against the Aegean Sea right there. And he's writing to a church that's not very far away, to Colossae. And so some of you picked up last week how we were, um, there's also a mention of letters to the Laodiceans. And so I could have added it to this image, but I want to bring up this other image. So you can see Ephesus is over here on the coastline and just inland a little bit, you see Colossae and right next to it, Laodicea. So Laodicea is a town right near there. So Paul makes reference to that later and says, hey, check out the letter that also went to them. Don't just check out this letter, check out that letter. Now we don't have that letter. Um, but what we do have is this letter to the Colossians. So the point being that this is this young church that's not very far away and he's writing from prison and he wants to convey some things. And it's also interesting because if you've been with us for a while, if you're a part of this church, um, or if you're a visitor, you might not know this, but if you've been a part of this, we've, for the whole last year, we're in this horticultural theme. And, um, Interestingly, that theme comes up again here right in this passage. Um, we borrowed that theme from the Bible, so it's not surprising that the Bible yet, yet again draws us to this horticultural theme, but he's bringing up a, a different um, emphasis on that horticultural theme because he's gonna talk about this new church plant, basically, the seed of the gospel is planted here and that it's bearing fruit. And the gospel is bearing fruit all over, including in Colossae. And so that's what he wants to do is talk to this young church. And this is the way he's going to start the letter. And since uh, Ben already prayed for us, I don't feel a need to pray. We're good. God's got us covered. We're going to enter right into the paragraph that starts, we always. So it'll be up there on the screen or on your letter, or you can just listen. We always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's holy people, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is kept safe for you in the heavenly places. You heard about this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. You learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And it was he who informed us of your love in the spirit. 
For this reason, since the day we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all the strength that comes from his glorious power to have perseverance and patience in all things while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So with that passage in mind, um, I wonder if you know this word, Eucharist, Eucharist. Um, It's not a word that we often use around here, but there are lots of Christian traditions who use this word on a weekly, if not daily basis to describe this sacrament that Christ gave us. We tend to call it communion or the Lord's Supper, but others call it Eucharist. Um, which I don't know about you, but to me, just when I hear that word, Eucharist, um, it strikes me as a particularly kind of religious, um, thoroughly liturgical kind of word. And so I just want to acknowledge that in light of that, that can be off-putting to some people, some people who have had a bad experience with sort of the ritualistic nature of liturgy. But remember if you are one of those people, that this word predates any overly stuffy ritualistic tradition that we've created. And this English word comes from the Greek word, the language of the New Testament, Greek, and it comes from this word, eucharisteo, eucharisteo. And the reason I bring this up is because this section of the book, this letter to the Colossians, starts with that word. It starts with that word. It begins by him giving thanks. So it's got this ending to it that has we, attaches the plural. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And it starts with that word, thanks, thanks. And it ends with him hoping that if they are walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, that they too will be giving thanks, joyfully giving thanks is what it says, to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. So this is another one of those major themes. So I just talked about a couple of the themes we talked about last week. This is another one of those major themes that we could draw out if we want to see the forest instead of the specific trees of what's in Colossians because Paul implores the Colossians on six different cases to give thanks, to be people of gratitude, people of thankfulness. And here he is saying that that's the posture that we, him and Timothy, start with. And he's hoping that that's the posture that they adopt, a posture of giving thanks, which in and of itself is great guidance, is it not? If you just want to take something simple away from this passage today, take this away from it, that if you don't know what to do or what to pray, give thanks. If you don't know what to do or what to pray, give thanks. Um, One of my favorite theologians, Alexander Schmemann, he said that um, our primary sin is one of ingratitude. And one of the primary effects of Genesis chapter 3 is that we no longer live Eucharistic lives. That is, lives that are just lives of gratitude. Because that's, that's one of the things that's happened. There they are before the fall. They have every opportunity to just be thankful. Thankful for life and purpose and meaning and truth and beauty and goodness. And then they trade it in. And they trade it in. They choose to pursue their own ends and forget to live Eucharistic lives. Lives of gratitude. And we see that. We turn our gratitude towards a lot of things that are not the ultimate object of gratitude. And if you're familiar with it, all sorts of psychological research has shown that gratitude leads to well-being, right? And if we've become 
ungrateful coming out of the fall, man, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That we can look at that research, any of that psychological research and say, yeah, those results echo exactly what the Bible is trying to tell us, that we should be grateful and that the object of our gratitude should be God the Father. And it's because of this pattern that we see in the Bible and in particular spots like this in Colossians that we make gratitude a key part of our worship, our gathering when we get together. So yeah, um, this table is one of the places that that shows up, that this table is supposed to be the high point of Christian worship. So not just our opening praise, um, not just a sermon, but that the table is supposed to be this high point of Christian worship, not simply because we remember what Christ did for us, um, but also because it's an opportunity to be thankful to God, to orient our lives in a posture of gratitude. And that's why from the very beginning, Christians called it Eucharist. That's why some of those other traditions still call it that, because the very earliest, earliest Christians called it Eucharist and had these very large prayers of thanks every time they celebrated this meal. And that's why, again today, when we come to this table, we'll have this very large prayer of thanks, Eucharistio, that borrows from all these ancient resources and says, calls right at the beginning, right? Says, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise, holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. Gratitude, to live Eucharistic lives, not just celebrate the Eucharist, but live Eucharistic lives. So we're joining brothers and sisters over the ages who have given thanks, Eucharisto. And Paul is thankful to God the Father for many things in Colossians, but right here at the beginning, he's thankful that the gospel has taken root. He's thankful for their faith and love that spring from hope. Faith, hope, faith, love, and hope. Same, same words that are used in that great passage in 1 Corinthians 13. And this is what he says in particular here in Colossians. We have heard of your faith, in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's holy people, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is kept safe for you in the heavenly places. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is kept safe for you in the heavenly places. So they hear about this hope. And why do they need hope? They need hope because in this present life, things don't all let up. Things don't work out perfectly, things don't make sense, Seems like things, things don't seem to reflect God's intention. So they've heard about this hope that's kept safe for them in the heavenly places as they live out this early life that will eventually brought, be brought forth in an age to come. And access to that hope is through faith, through faith in Christ Jesus, which it's really important helpful just to even say it Christ Jesus as opposed to Jesus Christ because Christ is not his last name right Christ is more of a vocation a role uh, a way of understanding this is the anointed one this is the Messiah this is our savior and redeemer this is the one who grants us access to that hope that is out there so place your faith in this one Christ Jesus and hope and faith naturally lead to Love That if we have hope for this future life, and if we have faith that it comes about through trusting Christ Jesus who lovingly sacrificed on our behalf, if that's true, then it naturally leads to love on our part. And so what is he given thanks for? Faith, that they've rooted themselves in this hope. And that because of that, they have this love. And so I think it's just as important, not only for what it mentions, but also for what it doesn't Mention because this new church is coming into being in Colossae. And Paul's not thankful first and foremost for their newfound holiness and obedience to some sort of moral code. He certainly hopes, as he's gonna say later in the letter, that they will adopt a new way of life and that they'll put on new clothes, clothe yourselves and some new stuff is what he's gonna say. But he's not rejoicing over that just yet. Nor is he particularly thankful for their knowledge and their understanding. And again, he's going to pray that they grow in knowledge, but not just yet. Even more than any of that, he's thankful for what he hears about their love. 
We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's holy people, that you learned it, that the good news from Epaphras, and it was he who informed us. So he comes back and reports to them. What does he report to them? Of their love in the spirit. That's what he reports to them. Their love in the spirit. And this love doesn't simply mean that they have good feelings about each other. They may or may not have good feelings about each other. It means that they behave in such a way that marks them out side of much of the world, the stuff that he's going to get into later, lust, anger, lies, bitterness, and so on, all these things that split up families and communities, all of that's being replaced by kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, and an acceptance of one another as members of the same family, even where they have major differences. So this isn't just love that's the opposite of hate. This is, this is love that's the opposite of indifference. This is love that's the opposite of grudge holding. This is love that's the opposite of sort of silo maintenance with only my friends who aren't just one piece of this giant body. This is a community that's marked by love for each other. That's the first thing that gets reported to him by Epaphras. That's the first thing that he says that he's thankful for. That has got to be some sort of aspirational goal for any local church, including Faith Reformed Church. Amen? And, yeah, which leads to this second part of this prayer. He's going to be, he's got this heart for them because they've got their faith and love that's manifested because they trusted in this hope. And then in the second part, you can really start to feel Paul's heart even more as he gets into this second thing. So there's this fledgling church in Colossae. And they have a sense of God's promises and God's love, um, but he knows they're going to need much more than that in the days ahead. That they need nurture and development. But Paul, Paul's in prison. He can't be there to help them with whatever this next phase is. And so he's praying that they might be able to take that next step. So he's thankful beyond measure for hope and faith and love, but he also wants to make sure that they grow. He wants to see that they add wisdom and understanding, which stems from them being filled with the knowledge of God's will, filled with the knowledge of God's will, which I think is just this great prayer. Oh, that we would be filled with the knowledge of what God desires for the world. Because, of course, our, one of our fundamental problems is that we're disconnected from his will, that our, our, our own will gets in the way, and we're flooded by all sorts of messages that are not about his will. So there's all these reasons why we are not filled with the knowledge of his will. And so, oh, that we would be full of that knowledge. There are many other good forms of knowledge, but none as good as that, as his will. None as good as that. And not so that we can mindlessly serve God's authoritarian will, like be filled with his will so that you can just mindlessly serve this one, like an authoritarian leader, but so that we can live the best possible human life that there is, one that reflects God's glorious intentions for his creation. Because there are, there are at least two lies which the world often tells about God's intentions regarding human behavior. And the first is that people say that God doesn't seem to want to us to have a good time. That part of what it means to be filled with his will and live that out, that's drudgery. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Paul's saying right here. He doesn't say that it's drudgery. It says that God's intention for human life is to flourish and bear fruit for us to grow in this knowledge of God. Not that God will keep himself from us, but that we will know the God of the universe, which what could be more powerful than that? 
than knowing the God of the universe and that we'll be strengthened. And then the list goes on in the verses that follow this so that we'll have patience and perseverance and be able to joyfully give thanks. That doesn't sound like drudgery. To be filled with the knowledge of his will is not to be subject to God in an oppressive manner where we don't have a good time. It's about flourishing and bearing fruit and being joyful and having all the greatest gifts of God's intentions for us. And we live very far from that. So some people like to talk about the cost of discipleship, but there's a cost to non-discipleship. And there's a joy to discipleship. And that's what he's trying to describe. It stands out according to these lies that we tell. A second lie that the world tells about God's intentions for human behavior is that even if we try to do what God wants, the best we'll get is some sort of grudging approval. That God's just waiting for us to step out of line so that God can smite us or something like that. But... That's not the story that Paul's telling here. Paul's telling a different story. Paul does this often. He often declares that genuine Christian living gives God pleasure. That it is we with our little faith who have imagined God to be just overly grumpy and hard to please. That God in fact takes delight in watching us become who he has created us to be. And sometimes we feel like if we have the littlest failure around that, that God's just so angry with us. And I, you know, in our pilgrim journey class, I told the story this past week of my friend, Nate, who loves to tell the story of watching his son, Luke, learn how to walk. And when he and his wife, Sarah, were watching Luke learn how to walk, you know, when Luke took a step and then fell on his keister, his parents didn't go, how dare you? How come you can't walk yet? Right? They never said that. Instead, they were beaming with joy. You took a step. And then when Luke took another step, they didn't say, I can't believe you failed again. Instead, they're beaming with joy that Luke, I took another step, right? And I think the same thing is true for us that after we've placed our faith in this hope and, and we just see have, have this fledgling love for one another that we could learn to his will and it is not gonna be this process that happens overnight where we completely get his will, but that as we're filled with his will and start to bear fruit, that even if we mess part of that up, you know what? I think God's still pretty pleased. I think God's still pretty pleased. And what would it be like if you actually told the story that Paul's telling here instead of the story that God's just ready to smite you when you take that step out of line, that in fact, you told the story that Paul's telling here that God is pleased with you as all this stuff comes to fruition in your life. And what would it look like to just be enraptured by the joy of the Lord? I don't know. Something worth considering. Uh, it's worth considering a couple of things. You know, what can we say about this prayer at the beginning of Colossians? One, that it begins and ends with gratitude. Eucharisteo. Begins and ends with gratitude. And that's informative for us. Not only in worship, celebrating the Eucharist, which we will in a moment, but that we would live Eucharistic lives, lives that are filled with gratitude. And what else? That we would know the hope stored away from us, put our faith in Christ Jesus, and from that hope and faith, love one another. Love one another. That we'd really, it's part of that hope, and we sang about it this morning, that anchor of hope. Our anchor is in that hope that it's stored up for us in that heavenly places. And if we have some grasp of what it is, we can't help but love the way God has loved us. And then finally, that we might take away a third thing, that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will, which is this bold prayer, but it just might lead to the glorious, joyful fulfillment of God's intentions for what a human life ought to look like. So if you wanna take something away from Colossians, ask yourself, how can I live a more Eucharistic life? Not just participate in communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, which is a great step 
One of the reasons we like to do it as a normal part of our worship. But not just that, also a Eucharistic life. I think this is, should be one of our primary prayers that we pray, even though most of our prayers are about intercession. God, give us this, give us this, give us this. And maybe it should be thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, it's basics. But another thing you could ask yourself, how can I form this into a more loving community? The kind of community that Epaphras reports to Paul. And that, that the formation of that kind of community is not solely on me or some other leader. Don't wait for us. Trust me, that's something we want to do. We want to love people as best we can and create a loving community, but I'm imperfect. I'm an imperfect leader. So better so are so many other leaders around here. And you can act like an owner and create the loving community yourself and be a part of that so that we might be known by that. And so that somebody who comes and visits us can walk away and be like, man, that's a loving community. Not just a welcoming, friendly community, a loving one. So that's another thing. How can I live a more Eucharistic life? How can I form this into a more loving community? Maybe another question, how can I be filled with the knowledge of his will? Not just be filled with rules, but filled with wisdom and understanding so that you can flourish and bear fruit and grow and all the rest that goes with it. But filled with the knowledge of his will so we can differentiate it from our own will and our culture's will, just that we've been brought up in. Not that our own will is necessarily mutually exclusive or our culture's, but be filled with the knowledge of his will so that we can live that kind of wise life. So, yeah, let's pray. Lord, joining with Paul's prayer, we pray. We give thanks for you. We give thanks for the work that you've done. We give thanks for the way that in which the gospel is bearing fruit in the world and bearing fruit in this place. And we do pray that coming out of that, that would spring forth not only faith, but love in the way in which we conduct ourselves everywhere where we live, work, and play. We pray that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will. And we know that's a dangerous prayer because we love our will. So what would it look like to embrace your will? It's going to be painful. So help us. And we know that uh, it won't just be painful. It could be a source of flourishing and bearing fruit and having patience and perseverance and joyfully being able to give thanks back to you. So come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And all your people say, amen.